I call this meeting of the Davenport Community School District Board of Directors to order. Um, before we get started, I do want to say thank you very much, uh, especially student board members, for being here. And we really do appreciate your, your attendance at our meetings. Um, hopefully, it'll be a good, exciting year for you to be here with us. And, and I want to encourage you to try to participate. It, it might be hard sometimes to get my attention, but try. And especially if there's something that's going on. And sometimes the board members will try to um, encourage me to, to call on you to see what your thoughts are. But thank you very much, and thank you uh, all the parents and families for being here as well. Um, it's just amazing for us to have these great students here uh, representing their different schools, but representing themselves as well. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. We appreciate your attendance at this board meeting. This is stuff that I read. It's like boilerplate. Um, by attending meetings, you can learn about the accomplishments, needs, and concerns we face. The One other thing I have to tell you, Sally talked to me on the way in. Sally, can you hear me now? Okay. She said that uh, sometimes we don't speak into the microphones. <coughs> and uh, just a little uh, encouragement that we all try to speak into the microphones. So thank you, Sally, for that. Uh, the board meets regularly on the first Monday for committee of the whole meetings and second and fourth Mondays of each month for regular meetings. Open forum for the public is available only at regular meetings. All meetings are open to the public except closed and exempt sessions which are permitted by certain sections of Iowa Code. All board decisions, however, are made in public open session. The board is not a forum, it is a deliberative body. Accordingly, it receives communications, both oral and written, as a medium of information. It does not debate the contents of such communications, but considers them in making decisions and in the establishment of policies. During each regular board meeting, there is an opportunity to address the board by completing an open form request and giving it to the board secretary prior to the meeting. Each person may have up to two minutes of time to speak. This is a time of listening by the school board, so the board does not make any comments during open forum. The issue will usually be referred to the administration for further study and follow-up if necessary. When the board president recognizes you, direct your comments to the entire board and limit your remarks to two minutes, unless extra time has been approved by the board president prior to the meeting. The school board president will recognize one speaker at a time and will rule out of order other speakers who are not recognized. Only those speakers recognized by the chair will be allowed to speak. Comments by others are out of order. The school board president shall promptly rule out of order any discussion by any person, including school board members, that would violate the provisions of state or federal law, our open forum policy, or the statutory rights of privacy of an individual. To ensure that the board can conduct the important business of the district, the following guidelines apply to all members of the public who attend board meetings. The board asks that all members of the public treat open forum speakers, district employees, and the board with respect. Individuals are not permitted to engage in conduct that interferes with the ability of other individuals to watch the board meetings, interferes with the ability of other members of the public to offer comment to the board, or interferes with the ability of the board to conduct its business. Demonstrations during public comments, such as clapping or cheering in response to either public comments or statements made by board members is discouraged. Those wishing to display placards, signs, and or banners may not block any attendees' view of the proceedings. We do have um, two of our board members are not here here tonight, and I'll say yet, um, Director uh, Hayes is ill tonight, and so she will not be coming. Uh, Director Mayfield is usually here, 
and Director Gosa is participating by phone. And is he on the line already? Okay. Um, so we'll start with Director hmm, Director DeSalvo. <laughs> Director DeSalvo, would you please read our priorities? <laughs> I'd be happy to. Our board priorities are the Davenport Community School Board establishes the following priorities to ensure the academic success of all students. Provide leadership and direction to improve the overall learning environment in our classrooms, schools, and district, including the health, safety, security, and happiness of students and staff. And to direct and support actions, programs, and activities which reduce the impacts of poverty on our students, their families, and our community. Thank you very much. Director Potts, would you please read our mission and vision statements? Mission statement. Enhance each student's ability by providing a quality education enriched by our diverse community. Our vision statement. Education that challenges conventional thinking, prepares all students to compete in a global society, and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you very much. Uh, we have a presentation, but before we get into that, I want to note that uh, we have made an agenda change and section 12, which is administrative reports, and it's 12.01, teaching and learning plan, uh, has been moved uh, into the superintendent's report. So it'll be a little bit sooner in the meeting. Uh, with that, we have a presentation, Superintendent Tate. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll call upon Rachel Steiner, please. Come forward and introduce the presentation. Good evening. We're here to celebrate a, a recent youth exchange, uh, a partnership with Davenport Sister Cities. We were first engaged by Davenport Sister Cities back in 2015 when they had a delegation coming in from China, and some of you actually participated in that group. Since that time, we have um, had members of Davenport Community Schools um, take on committee roles, board roles, participate in strategic planning, and Davenport Sister Cities has really engaged a youth agenda as part of their work. Um, they formed an international business academy in partnership with our curriculum office um, that's held each summer on St. Ambrose campus for high schoolers. Um, West High has emerged as a major leader in that initiative. And then this past year, they actually sent a delegation that included one of our principals in a trip to China. Um, the delegation visits are really important, and we'll have several coming up this year where they'll be visiting us here in Davenport. And they're a wonderful opportunity to kind of firm up partnerships and, and build exposure uh, to the different services in our communities. I was fortunate enough to attend one of those delegation visits in, in Kaiserslautern, Germany. And they were very excited about the return of the Kaiserslautern Youth Exchange. We're going to forward here. Is it here? Yeah. Okay. And I think we're going to um, let me hit this and we'll do introductions. And, okay. Yeah. So um, the Kaiser Slaughter Youth Exchange is something that was very um, prominent in our schools for many years. Um, this image actually is from the 1950s. Kaiser Slaughter has been a longtime partner in Davenport, and there was active youth exchange clear through the 1990s um, in our community. A strong history between our communities and support and military history with the Ramstein Air Force Base in the Arsenal Island um, Arts Exchange. And then we really wanted to focus on bringing back the youth exchange. We had an opportunity to visit with their junior engineers program in Kaiserslautern and at the Heinrich Heine Gymnasium. And um, we thought, what greater partnership would there be except with our world champion robotics team at West High? So Greg Smith is here with Craig Cole, who attended the visit, and the students. Introductions? I'm Greg Smith. I'm uh, the uh, STEM teacher at West. And I was one of the uh, leaders of the uh, group going over and also kind of leading the uh, delegation uh, that will be coming back over in April. I'm Craig Cole. Sorry. I'm Craig Cole, and uh, I'm the, uh, one of the other co leaders. I teach German at Davenport West and uh, went on the trip with them over there, and it was a really wonderful time and great experience for everything. So I'm really behind this. Hello, I'm Michael France. Uh, do you want me to? Okay. 
So when we went to Germany, we brought along with us uh, 15 students and four adults. Uh, five of the students spoke German, and when we returned, one of the students that didn't speak German uh, signed up for German class. Um, this year is the, the Goethe Institute um, is one of the, the is one of the major sponsors of this uh, this the, this thing that we've done this year. Uh, Goethe Institute promotes the teaching of German language and culture. It was also uh, part of the German American Partnership Program, which we are part of, uh, which involves an exchange on both ends. Um, as far as to we have a uh, students from here. Uh, obviously it stayed there with German families and the host families and of course they will be back here in April of 2019 also on the exchange. Uh, the Deutschland ja, that is the, uh, the that's what's going on there is from October 2018 until the end of 2019 uh, Germany and its deep ties to the US will be on display all across the United States. Um, the Deutschland ja will showcase uh, how closely the two uh, the two countries uh, are connected with uh, white heritage, common values, and uh, shared interests. Um, what we have here in this picture up here is Marcus Sporkman. He's the he's the gentleman uh, uh, who is recording Brandon Richards there. Uh, there, um, but he came down from the Goethe Institute. He, we, he actually came from, I believe, the New York office or the Washington D.C. office, and came here and he filmed the entire. Well, he was here for a day, pr uh, filmed us at West High School in preparation, and then when we got to Germany, he was there filming us in Germany, in Kaiserslautern, and at our competitions and everything else. To the Germans, it's a great big deal that they're doing this year, and uh, I'm, I, I think we're, I feel really uh, wonderful that we got to be included in that. Uh, that film should be done here uh, sometime here in October. And he will. Uh, that will be on the Goethe Institute website, and uh, it's it's a big deal for them, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us. Hello, my name is Brandon Richards. Uh, I went on the the exchange, and this is an uh, image from the welcome reception. So when we showed up, uh, we were able to meet our host families. Uh, we all talked, and then we went inside. That's actually inside the HHG or the Heinrich Heine uh, Gymnasium. And we were able to talk to our families, some of the other families, and also like Frau Barth, or Mrs. Barth and Mrs. Bush, which were uh, some of the facilitators and really helped out during the whole entire trip. All right, this, uh, this trip would not be possible without the uh, numerous sponsors we had. Um, the students fundraised and uh, put personal money in, but we also wrote some grants, Great Minds, um, JC's the Quad Cities, Davenport Noon Optimist, uh, Davenport Schools. And then uh, on the other side, uh, the German American Women's Club supported all the trips that we went on. Um, and then obviously the uh, high school uh, provided uh, a place to meet. And then the GAP program provided us uh, some funding as well. So one of the first places that we went to when we went to Germany was uh, Trier, Germany. Um, this is Germany's oldest city, and uh, as you can see in that picture, that is the Porta Nigra, which is an old uh, Roman gate, which used to be a part of a Roman city that was there. Hello there, I'm Mason Hancock. Um, so while we were there, we also traveled to Luxembourg, and specifically Luxembourg City. We visited the shopping district in the downtown area to try and get a feel for what it was like to be in one of the most wealthy areas of the world at this point. So Luxembourg City is actually one of the de facto capitals of the European Union. It's home to the European Investment Bank and numerous other wealthy businesses and where they have their own companies and headquarters all located right there. Um, I'm Cody Nieper-Burris. Um, so we, when, when, while we were there, we were able to um, uh, go to one of the John Deere locations that's in Germany, and they work very closely with the uh, one in Moline. So it was interesting to see the connections that not only we were forming with the German students, but that um, two uh, branches of uh, the same company were working together. Personally, this is one of the favorite places we went to because they use so much like technology and sensors and new stuff. So uh, when we were at that, uh, the the headquarters there, they showed us the 
uh, precision agriculture and what goes into that. And then we went to this research farm and they were able, sh able to show us some of the new technologies like they have uh, simulators, like really in-depth simulators with control panels right in front of you. So you're able to drive like virtual tractors and combines. And then um, let's see, in the, the picture on the left, they're showing the new technology they have where they're uh, keeping track of how long the cows eat and how much they do eat per day. And that helps them uh, figure out like how much food they need and the, the yield. And then on the right, we have some pictures of some vehicles we were able to drive in. But the thing is, they were actually driving themselves. <laughs> so the people there, they got us in there. And then the, they were able to use GPS. And they just drove us like around uh, all on their own. So I thought that was really cool. Hi, I'm Alyssa Rodriguez. Um, before we actually went to Germany, there was a lot of preparation that needed to be done, and some of this preparation included, included preparing for this thing called Explore Science. And Explore Science is basically a whole bunch of activities coming together um, that we had to participate in. We had to build different kind of like robots for, I guess. Um, so we got two different objectives that we had to complete. And so in these pictures, you can see that we were in groups of like three to four, and we had to design them and build them, and then we had to like disassemble them <laughs> for, uh, for the travel and put them back together. So that was a really fun time. So building off of that, in the competition, we were given two different tasks. Our first task was to launch a tennis ball into a set of 10 different cans and try and knock down as many as we could with our robot. And our other uh, task was to collect upward, up to 100 ping pong balls in a three minute time period and basically try and collect as many as you can as fast as you can. And actually in the ping pong, ping pong ball collection task, our one of our teams placed ninth in the whole competition. So. Another really fun competition that we got to do was a 24-hour robotics competition, and it's just as fun as it sounds. So <laughs> once we got to the school, we were met with, of course, the German students who we were all there with, and as well as some other Ger German students who we hadn't quite met yet. But we got put into different groups, um, a mixture of the American students and the German students. And then we got to this room over here on the right. Um, that's basically the maze that our robot had to drive around, and we were building this robot out of uh, EV3 kit parts, so that's a different type of uh, robotics. So if you can see the little like construction paper looking stuff on the ground, basically we had to pick up different color blocks, and our robot would have to detect when it was on that certain color and drop the corresponding color block onto it. So after we got all of that information, we split up into our groups in different classrooms, and we spent the next 24 hours building our robot, testing it, designing it, all that. <laughs> so on the uh, left picture, you can see an example of one of the robots that our team built. So at the bottom, where you can see the light on the ground, that's actually one of the sensors that they use to detect the different colors, and so they could tell when they weren't over the white ground anymore. And then at the top, you can see the three different colored blocks, so then that conveyor belt would move, and the block would fall, hopefully, onto the paper. And then they would obviously score the points. And then on the uh, right picture, you can see the different uh, 11 robots that were made by the 11 teams. And then I think five or six of those were made by our group. And then right here is um, the winning group. So actually, that's me right now. I'm right there. <laughs> so my group won, um, along with the three other students that we have there. So um, there's Hunter, who is um, one of the other students that came from Davenport West. and then. Um, the two German students on our team, along with the two uh, men that were facilitating the event. So aside from the robotics portion of our trip, we also went around to visit and understand a little bit about the culture. One of our tr stops was at Neustadt, and basically we visited a castle there, where in 1832, 30,000 individuals held a festival to basically celebrate the uni uniting of Germany lands. And this allowed not only a lot more freedom within the country, but it also helped promote the economy because from the unity of the actual German land, this prevented taxes from traveling from numerous different countries. So merchants were now able to basically sell more for more profit as well. And there they also have the original German flag promoting the black, red, and gold colors. And that is on display that we all got to see as well.
So my favorite part of the entire trip was we actually got to visit Strasbourg, France. And it's my favorite because we got to visit the European Union Parliament. So if you take a look up at the picture, this area is actually where all of the European diplomats pose for like their photo ops. Um, so I thought that it was such an honor to be able to stand there with all of my student peers and the German students um, and get to take a picture there. While we were there, we also got a guided tour from a man who was kind enough. Um, he was actually friends with one of the teachers who was working at the school that we were all working with. Um, so yeah, he was kind enough to take on the position as a tour guide for us. The left picture is actually called the, uh, the viewing gallery, and the right picture is the parliament floor. So it was really, really interesting to get to see where the European Union you know, makes all of their decisions. Um, something else that we did while we were in Strasbourg, France, is we got to get on a boat ride on the, on the river. So it was a boat ride, and it was like kind of like glass ceiling, and it basically just took us all around the river that we were on, and they gave us like different historical facts about Strasbourg, France. Um, all of the different attendees got to put on headphones, and you could actually pick what language you wanted your tour guide to speak to you in. So on the last day uh, that we were in Germany, we went to Heidelberg. And while we were there, we got to ride a cable car up to, the, uh, up to a castle in Heidelberg, which was a very, very old castle that was in ruins after the French attacked it. Um, and we had a lot of fun there. We got a nice tour, and we got to learn a lot of fun facts about it. And uh, when we were done there, as you can see that in the back is the castle, um, when we were done with the tour, we went down to the city and uh, spent the rest of the day with all of our exchange partners uh, shopping and just having a fun time. So what's next? So in April of uh, 2019, a delegation from Kaiserslautern will attend uh, uh, for about two and a half weeks the, and do an exchange with the students out west. Um, we're going to try to do a, a Quad City Engineering Science Council competition uh, called the Trebuchet uh, Contest, um, and then try to do a number of different other activities, uh, go on tours uh, local to uh, the Quad Cities. But also we're going to partner with the uh, German American Heritage Center um, to launch the, uh, the Kaiserslautern exhibit, as well as the uh, filming um, that was uh, done here. And then uh, there's going to be a mayoral delegation coming over as well. Um, sometime in April. You guys have any questions? I'm sure there are. Um, <laughs> Director Beck. Um, first of all, what a great experience for all of you guys to be able to, to do that. And it's nice to go to Germany because most people speak English there, so <laughs> you didn't have to worry about um, as much of a language barrier. It sounds like you guys stayed mostly in the north. Um, south. south, sorry, south. Um, <coughs> but uh, when you were over there, so it's an exchange program, you guys actually stayed with host families, is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about how that experience was? Any, any one of you be happy to talk about that a little bit? Uh, so while we were there, we were uh, provided lodgings uh, by the families. Some students stayed at a boarding school at the Heinrich Heinz Gymna uh, Gymnasium. Uh, but that was more so just kind of a way to look into uh, family life in Germany. Uh, especially for me, as I'm in German, and I'd always hear uh, how it worked over there. And it was uh, kind of different from uh, my normal life, where I make my own breakfast and I get myself ready for school. Uh, while I was there, my uh, host family would make my lunch or make my breakfast. They'd get me up. And um, it, was, it was a little weird, because they would like, speak, to Germ like, speak German really fast, and I couldn't really understand them. So I, I didn't know if they were talking about me or what it was, but they'd always, they'd always try to translate for me, which was really nice. Thank you. Director DeSalvo. I love this. I am so proud of you guys. You can see my grinning up here. I'm just amazed and so proud of you for going over there and representing Danport Community Schools in such a, an honorable fashion. So 
kudos to all of you. I think this is just amazing, and I can't wait for them to come here. And I want you to bring them. Well, don't make them sit through a whole school board meeting, but <laughs> maybe we would love to meet them. So let us know events, because because we would really enjoy attending them. And um, were there other other students from other countries there, or was it just us in Germany? <coughs> just us in Germany. Were they like really good technology? I mean, I'm thinking of Volkswagen and oh my gosh, you know, the cars that they make. Was w w Would you say that they were pretty technologically advanced? Technologically? Yeah, so the school was really nice. And then like all around the area in there, they have a lot of like institutes. Uh, there's It's a university city as well. So there was like an artificial intelligence institute and they have places where you can go and like do uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. They provide equipment and like the college students are able to go and work on like personal projects and do research there. So I thought all of that was like super cool and uh, really technolo cool. technologically advanced. Really, really interesting. Well, thank you again for, I know it takes a lot to fundraise. I know it takes a lot to get over there and you're probably involved in a million other things too. So really, really nice. I'm very proud of all of you. Director Potts. Yeah, I suppose the thing you probably didn't like the most was the flight over and then back. <laughs> Long time. What, w what was the thing that you were most impressed or surprised about that you weren't expecting? Um, one thing I was surprised by was the uh, Germans' affinity for sweetness. Uh, they, like, we all know what Nutella is, right? I swear, every morning they had a jar of Nutella and they'd go through about half of that. <laughs> they, they loved their sweets. Uh, every morning uh, they'd have, like, Nutella on, like, pancakes or something like that. Um, and they would always make me lunch and it would always have, like, different chocolates or just candies in there. And they always liked um, having uh, like sugary drinks. And um, another thing that surprised me was just how uh, nice the people were. I was expecting there to be a couple of kind of rude people. Uh, you find them everywhere. But I was honestly surprised that if I had a question and I could just go up and ask some random person, and they'd love to help me out. Anything more? Director Gosa, do you have anything? No, I don't hear him. Sometimes it takes him a little bit of time because he's on mute. Um, well, I got a couple things. I tell you, this was exciting. And, and I didn't count <coughs> the number of times that you used the word fun, but after a while, <laughs> I figured you must have expressed that at least 10 times <laughs> during your, your presentations. And, and I thought, how wonderful all of you are. It, it was amazing, and I thought if we had a spare hour or two, it'd be great to just engage in conversation about all this. It's, it's fantastic. And, and I got to tell you, the one little section on simulators, I was thinking about that, and I imagine they're John Deere simulators, right? Mm -hmm. And do they have noise and vibration along with the controls? Yeah, so actually it was just uh, they showed us the building and we went in and yes, the, the, the seat moved. There were the controls all the way around and then there were like uh, huge monitors like as, as tall as the seat, you know, they were uh, in front of me to my left and my right. It was, it was wild. <laughs> it felt like I was actually there. <laughs> well, and that's what I was thinking. What a great experience because a lot of people don't get a chance to drive big tractors and big combines <laughs> and, and uh, that's got to be great. Um, I won't go on too long. I, I have to thank um, Rachel Steiner. You didn't go, I assume, but you're such a key player in this whole Lenderschlagen, whatever it is, um, <laughs> the sister city thing, though. And, and I was wondering if you can just uh, encapsulate a little bit your role. Sure. So um, we got pulled to the table, like I said, during the China visit. And since then, we've kind of been leading the charge on education partnerships with sister cities. Um, and we've had folks that have stepped onto committees. Mr. Smith and Mr. Cole are both on the education committee. Um, and I've served on the board. Um, so we've been working with them for a couple of years to bring back the youth 
focus, including the Kaiser Slaughter and Youth Exchange in time for the big anniversary coming up. So, just absolutely stunning, Thanks. and thank thank you all for for the work you're doing, for enjoying school and and participating in these great events, and we look forward to you being leaders in some of this in the future. <laughs> so, thank you very much. We'll give you guys a hand. Okay, um, next is the uh, student board reports. Uh, thank you. Uh, so students, as you report tonight, if you have somebody here with you that you'd like to introduce, please feel free to do so. And Carson will be in this way and move down the table. Uh, my mom, if you can stand. Is she still here? Um, she's gone. So. <laughs> um, this, the past couple weeks at West have been uh, pretty interesting. Uh, we got some cool stuff coming up. Uh, last Thursday was the NHS induction, where we had uh, 58 new members be inducted. So our total members are uh, 121 members at West, so that's pretty cool. And uh, last Friday, the West Drumline traveled to uh, Trinity School, and we kicked off their glow run. Uh, all the young kids wore glow necklaces, glitter, and, a co and a colorful hairspray. Our drumline played in front of everyone right before the race started, and I actually saw Mr. Johansson there with colorful hair, and he was having a good time. <coughs> so, so high. Okay, so at West, the hunger drive actually started today. All of Student Senate is really excited, and the rest of the student body as well, to end hunger in our community. Um, and then the last thing is our blood drive is Wednesday. So each year, many students head down to the West YMCA at all times throughout the school day, and they donate their blood for a good cause. Um, I, my parents are in the back. They can wave. Yeah. Uh, last weekend, our marching band went to two competitions, and they got first in both, and they also won best horn line, best percussion, and best drum majors in both competitions. I think my mom's still here somewhere. No, she's gone. <laughs> All right. Central's newest club, the Interact Club, is holding their first meeting on the 25th. The club is designed to provide opportunities for students to take part in community services and provide volunteer opportunities. We had an Army Interactive Semi come to Central uh, last week, and I was one of the classes that got to go. And it, in the semi, we had an anti-bullying like presentation, and then outside they had a bunch of robots that you could like play with, and if you completed the object, you got prizes. Central and Eastern Iowa Community College teamed together to provide our students with the opportunity to attend a job fair in George Marshall Gym. Through their efforts, our Counseling and Student Services Department and Eastern Iowa Community College staff brought together over 50 professionals and local businesses with our sophomores and juniors to discuss potential career pathways, the application process, and how to project a positive image in an interview. Our boys golf team placed third overall in the MAC conference meet this weekend. Uh, the team shot 338 on Friday and 359 on Saturday, and they placed right behind PV and Bettendorf. And this is the best team placement in several years. And lastly, the Central Tag Program is hosting a fundraiser at Chipotle Mexican Grill on Elmore and Davenport from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, this will be on Wednesday, and 50% of all proceeds will benefit the Central Tag Program. Um, my parents aren't here because they're working, but if they had the ability to, they definitely would have been here. Um, so our homecoming week was last year, or last week. Uh, so we were supposed to have our parade on Wednesday, but it rained three quarters of an inch in an hour. So that was canceled, but gladly we made up for it by winning our homecoming game against Linmar. And we have a four and one record this year, which is almost never happens. So that's awesome. <laughs> um, and then our student hunger drive is also kicking off, kicking off this week. Uh, student council is helping to win the award for most improved this year, since we were really close last year. And we're also hoping to do a lot more community outreach activities through the hunger drive. 
and our drumline is joining with other drumlines in the area to fundraise for mental health awareness and beat the stigma against mental health. Um, okay, so ditto on what she said about parents working, but um, so we recently have a new cultural diversity club that just started up, and I'm really excited because November 5th, we're going to take a trip to the Hispanic, Hispanic Art Museum in Chicago, and also we're going to go a little through the neighborhood, and a lot of us are in Spanish class, and then a lot of people are also just bilingual, so we'll get to practice talking with, like, the authentic restaurants and everything. Um, our play is coming up, Noises Off, which is a hilarious three-act comedy, and we're going to have those performances in three weeks, um, October 12th through 14th. And some sports that we have coming up are on Tuesday, we have a volleyball game versus Burlington at North, and Friday we have a football game versus Iowa City High in Iowa City. Um. I personally have not been at school the past few days. I've been sick, but and then I was at school today and I could not find my principal for an update. And so the only thing I could come up with today was our scavenger hunt that Missy was going to have. They didn't have enough teams that signed up in time so for Saturday, so it's canceled. But I do have a coupon for Buffalo Islands and 10% of your um, bill goes to Mid-City, so it comes back to the school for funding. So that's pretty exciting for our school so I have so thank you students uh, those are great reports and we appreciate having you here and learn what's going on out there okay thank you very much are there any board reports director DeSalvo yes I have a couple things um, let's see first of all um, had a meeting with the city that went very well um, Unfortunately, Director Potts wasn't able to make it that night, but I think we're making some good progress in communication with them. Um, we're starting to develop our mission statement. Um, we talked about, I know a parent had brought forward at a former board meeting concern about the Elm Street Bridge repair, and I, I know that they had gotten back to the district about that, so um, they, we just shared that. So that's just one example of things that we can talk about um, that are kind of common issues or common goals or common things that we're working on. So I'm really, really happy with this group and we're, we're, um, we're gonna do some good things, I think, so. Then um, had a legislative advocacy committee meeting last Wednesday. Um, it was Rachel, myself, Dan Flaherty, and Mary Crothers that attended. And right now, the legislative advocacy group is really focusing on getting people out to vote. Um, and so I know I was talking to Brady earlier and those of you that are 18 or coming upon 18, it's an election year and exercise your right to vote. Um, I called Roxanna Moritz, um, our county auditor, and she is gonna be at all the high schools registering students to vote in the month of October. I don't have those dates on me. I'm sorry I didn't bring them with me, but look for her or her staff to be in your lunchroom and she will register you right there on site. So that's very exciting. And um, I hope that perhaps we can get some more communication out in the schools and to our staff. Um, just it's, it's important that we um, exercise that right and we can make a difference so very excited about that and then we talked a little bit about um, our fall gathering that is coming up uh, that will be October 2nd um, here Mary we're in this boardroom from 530 to 7 we've invited our local legislators to come so it's an opportunity for the community to come and, and visit with them we break off into groups and we talk about different topics related to um, schools and our legislators so um, join us if you can we'll have more information coming out just kind of reminding people about that date but that's very a, a good time to meet with legislators and I think we're gonna have a good turnout because again it's an election year and I think they want to get their messages out to their constituents as well so attend that if you can um, and then we started plans already for our student bus trip which will be in February it's always on President's Day so we'll start working on that um, last year we were able to get the um, several of our, our local um, Davenport council members to use some of their community money to pay for the bus trip up so that we could get the kids up there. And then we have our UEN, the, the Urban Education Network that provides lunch for us. It's a great um, visit for the students to see the Capitol and understand the legislative process firsthand and, and get a view that. So a lot going on with legislative advocacy and, and then we'll see as the session starts and where we need to start focusing our attention. Um, and I think that's all I have. Thank you. Any other board reports? I have um, three notices. Uh, first, 
<coughs> to our fellow board member, uh, Director Clyde Mayfield and his family uh, for the passing of his brother, Carl Mayfield. Uh, we offer our condolences. Uh, also to the family of Barb Hess. Uh, she's a former teacher at Central and she taught there for 46 years. Um, our condolences to her family and also uh, Linda McClurg. Uh, she was one of the HR directors here at the district and uh, our condolences also to her family. Okay, we'll move on to communications. Director Beck. Um, <coughs> so we have a number of upcoming events. Uh, on October 1st, Monday at 5.30 p.m., we have our Committee of the Whole meeting. Um, but note that the location is not here. It's going to be at West High School um, because we are going to be able to take a look at and tour the career and techni technical education facilities. Um, the tour begins at 5.30 in the library and the committee of the whole meeting will follow after that. Um, on October 2nd, Tuesday from 5.30 to 7, that is when we have the annual le legislative fall gathering event. It will be here in the Jim Hester boardroom. October 3rd, Wednesday at 4 p.m., the policy committee will be meeting in the executive boardroom in this building. Um, also on October 3rd, Wednesday, the Mississippi Bend Area Education Association Board and Administrator Banquet will be held. Um, <coughs> and that will be at 6 p.m. There's a social hour uh, at 6.30, dinner, and then at 7 p.m., a program. Um, and that will be at the Mississippi Bend AEA Learning Center, 729 21st Street in Bettendorf. October 8th, a Monday at 5 p.m., we have a special op call open meeting to finalize the timeline for the superintendent search, and that will be here in the Jim Hester boardroom. Also, <coughs> on October 8th at 6 p.m., we'll have our regular meeting in this room. October 9th, uh, Tuesday, uh, is when we go before the school budget review committee meeting in Des Moines. Uh, the time and the exact location are yet to be determined. October 16th, Tuesday at 5.30 p.m., the local school improvement advisory committee meeting will be held here in the Jim Hester boardroom. And then October 22nd, Monday at 6 p.m., we have our regular board meeting, uh, the second one of October in this room. Thank you very much. Next is open forum. Open forum is a time for members of the community to give input at a board meeting regarding school district issues or concerns. Individuals who want to speak should fill out an open forum request and give it to the board secretary prior to open forum. The board will not act on any issue presented during open forum if it was not published as an agenda item. The Iowa Open Meetings Law prohibits action on any issue that is not on the agenda. The president will set the amount of time allowed for individuals to speak during open forum. The board asks that no charges or complaints be made against individual employees of the district or community during open forum. Remarks that reflect negatively on the character or motives of any person will be called out of order. We have three requests tonight. <coughs> And I'll allow uh, three minutes per presentation. And we'll start with Tom Peterson. When you come up, give us your name and address uh, and speak into the microphone. After Tom will be Debbie Defoe and Sally Ellis. Thank you, Tom. My name's Tom Peterson, 2611 West 68th Street, Davenport got a letter to read excuse me if I'm nervous and stuff uh, definition of a custodian person who has custody keeper and guardian a person entrusted with guarding and maintaining a property we are the heart and soul of each and every school building we just don't clean who do you think mows the grass and removes the snow in the winter time. We keep the school grounds looking nice. We answer calls during doing whatever teachers, principals, and the secretaries need done. We make it happen. 
We move furniture, fix furniture, clean and sanitize furniture. We do setups for events. For example, we set up bleachers, scoreboard, tables and chairs, and then afterwards tear them all down and clean up the mess. Then we make sure we have that <coughs> area ready for the next, next day class. The area that was used the area that was used has to be put back the way it was when we started. Then we have to help make sure that all the people are out of, all out of the building. We walk the building, checking windows and doors, making sure the building is secure. We also help save the district money by turning off all unused lighting, etc. There is so much more. The word janitor is not even thought of in our department. I would put our custodial team up against any other school district. You have to remember there is no I in team. We the custodial team work together communicating with each other to be the best that we can. Also the school district motto is to be the best. Communication is a key to the great communication is the key to a great business and that's what we do. Please think long and hard about outsourcing our team. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Next is Debbie Defoe. Hi, my name is Deb Defoe, 2128 Warren Street, Davenport, Iowa. I'm here again today to talk about the outsourcing dilemma. Two weeks ago, I brought forth information on surrounding districts and their outsourcing experiences. All schools I contacted either had no intention or terrible experiences with outsourcing. Since then, every night I was working, I found myself wondering, who will be getting the teachers extra things they need? Who will fix all our broken items? Who is gonna take care of the many after school events? Who will help the kids find their lost items, such as their homework, get their lockers unstuck, or help them when they have a question, or say just, can you help me? Who's going to make sure every room is neat and tidy, desks arranged, chairs pushed in, and everything in good working condition? Will anyone take pride in each classroom and know when they leave the school it's ready for the next day? Appearance is everything. It's our first impression to the public. Strangers are going to be here. They won't care if the kids need something or the teachers need a hand. They won't care if after school activities run smoothly. The turnover rate will be great. These strangers will not be invested in our family community. We highly value our career choice. It's not a stepping stone to another job for us. This is our family in the workplace. And I have a bunch of family out there. We give on and above the call of duty, cherish our children, our teachers, and staff, and make our schools shine. The fact is, though, we have to support our families. Many people cannot afford to go and work for the outsource company. As much as we love our careers, we'll be forced to look elsewhere. I know there are financial problems, but if we could gather together, collaborate, compromise, and seek the answers, we could come to a mutual beneficial solution. Let's not get in the predicament that Waterloo, West Des Moines, and all the other schools found themselves in, because hindsight's 2020, and, and we will suffer the consequences after the fact has already happened. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, next is Sally, Sally Ellis. Uh, thank you for hearing me, and thank you for all you do. It's wonderful. Um, outsourcing, lose, you lose control. Sally, I need your name and address. Oh, you know you keep telling me that, and I keep forgetting it. It's okay. It happens. I'm going to be 74. <laughs> Uh, Sally Ellis, 2216 North Nevada, Davenport, Iowa. Okay. Um, when you outsource, you lose control. Uh, for profit equals less bodies per square foot, less work. In-house, 
you've got green chemicals being used that's safe for the children. Outsource equals whatever is cheap. You're thinking they will hire your custodians, but for less equals turned into janitors with new bosses, new rules, less done, period. Sign a contract, you're stuck. No control. I'm asking, don't like the management now, how it's being managed? How about replacement of the management then with in-house? Hire new, advertise for new, Davenport schools, employees, stay in charge. Keep control, loyal, pride in their work and loving their schools and they're a school family and they need to be kept in-house, their, their family. And I wanna mention, um, I know Deb Defoe herself actually uh, spent the night at her school because a scout troop wanted to have an overnight camp thing in the, in the gym. So Deb says, I'll stay. So she, s she stayed the whole night at the school and slept at the school for the students. And that's what, things like that, you know, is humongous with in-house because they love their job. And I think that you should add to your vision and state statement um, add clean, well-maintained schools because our buildings, we've had, we've got a lot of buildings, a lot of them are very old. You go out through Davenport, they're tearing down buildings that are half this age because they're shot, but not ours because they've always been cared for by in-house custodians and maintenance. I thank you very much for your time. Please don't outsource. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, Tom and Deb or Debbie. You signed it Debbie, but everybody calls you Deb, apparently. So, uh, And Sally, of course, thank, thank you to all three of you for letting us know uh, your perspectives. It really is important, and we always invite people of our community to come and, and participate in our open forum. Thanks again. We'll move on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion? Mr. President. Director DeSalvo. I move that the board approve the consent agenda as written. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director DeSalvo. I have a question about the seal and stripe, the contract seal and stripe. Is that okay to ask questions? Can I ask? Um, I, I think so. Uh, it kind of depends on where you're going, but go ahead and try it. I, I'm just, I'm assuming that this wasn't obviously part of the estimates for the Brady Street project and came up later. I was just, if this wasn't a part of the original project plan for Brady Street, because this is the striping on the east side of the lot? No, it was not. Uh, there's been pavement repairs uh, that uh, were not a part of the original project at all. Was there any damage that caused this, or we're just adding it because we're out there? Um, well, because the condition of the parking lot has deteriorated to a point, there are potholes and things like that that, that, that need to be. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right, is there any other discussion on the consent agenda motion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Director DeSalvo? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries, thank you. May I have motion regarding approval of bills? Mr. President. Director Beck. I recommend that the board approve the recommendation by the administration for adoption of the bills from the bill listing periods of September 6, 2018 through September 19, 2018. 
resolved all claims presented to the board having been duly certified as correct by the secretary, reviewed by the administration and board members, and they are hereby and audited and allowed as just claims and warrants drawn on the treasury for the several amounts. Further resolved, the payment of claims and salaries be approved as presented for the periods of September 6, 2018 through September 19, 2018. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay. Call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director DeSalvo? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to the superintendent report. Uh, thank you. I'm going to yield my time to a review of our teaching and learning plan. Uh, you've heard us talk about the teaching and learning plan a lot because uh, it is the thing that drives our decision making. It uh, drives our goal setting as a district and through all the, all the way down to the schools and into the classroom. Our Corey guy is going to talk a little bit about the history, but I want to point out that um, the teaching and learning plan has been developing and it is a living document that can change. And as we put together our disproportionality action plan, it will be folded in the teaching and learning plan because there, there are some of our objectives and goals for the disproportionality that we'll need to make certain our district level as well as school level. So I want to point that out that uh, we're looking through things with a different lens now. Uh, and uh, it will uh, those will appear in our teaching and learning plan. So um, we've got several people to be reporting. We'll start with Corey. We'll talk a little bit about the background and history of the plan. Okay, good evening. I am Corey Guy. I'm the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment for Davenport School District. And I'm excited this evening to give you a little background on our teaching and learning plan. The teaching and learning plan was written in 2015-2016 school year. It was written as a five-year plan to align the resource, resources clearly focusing our efforts and goals to achieve high levels of teaching and learning for our school districts. This, the goals within the teaching and learning plan fall into eight broad categories and encompass 21 specific priority learning goals. Tonight, we're going to be presenting to you an overview of the three-year history of these priority goals that have become our building's expected goals. In 2016-17 school year, our buildings were asked to write a building goal for each and every goal listed. And so what you can see, and that is um, on A through C in your board packet, are those 21 goal areas. On the left-hand side are those broad areas that I will talk to. Um, we have a preschool goal that focuses on enrollment. We have a goal on our statewide assessment, which is the IO assessments. Our school board members are probably very familiar with taking that assessment each year, and that's given to all of our third through 11th graders. Last year was our last year taking the IO assessments, and the state has adopted a new assessment called the ISASP, is the acronym for it, and so we will have that going forward. Another broad category is our universal screening data. And so our universal screening data is, um, is given to kindergarten through eighth grade students. We give an assessment called the FAST assessment for reading and math. And that is really looking at how healthy our core is and ensuring that all students have what they need in their core instruction in the area of reading and math. You'll see FAST literacy there, A math and we'll be presenting a little bit more on that in a minute. Iowa Algebra Readiness Assessment is another universal screener that we give to all students in seventh grade to ensure that they are, have the pre-algebra skill, the algebra skills um, necessary to forward on into eighth grade pre-algebra standards. Our eighth grade um, math curriculum are pre-algebra standards and then going into algebra their freshman year. That gives us really good information and buildings information about what they can strengthen in seventh grade and also eighth grade to ensure success when students get to high school. Another one of our broad categories that we look at each year is our course final grades and that we look at this as an indicator of success in our middle and high school and under there we're looking at sixth, seventh, and eighth grade core classes, and when I say core classes, I'm referring to reading, math, science, and social studies. 
in high school, we're looking at freshmen taking the core classes, and those are specific core classes as freshmen. Earth and Space Science, we have, um, we have English One, Algebra One, and then World Studies. Sophomores, we also look at the high school, we look at the percentage of sophomores who are passing the following core courses, and those courses uh, that would be on track would be Geometry, English Two, Biology, and U.S. History. Another area that we look at is attendance and behavior. And with attendance and behavior, th these two goals, um, we, look, we look at them also with the lens of some of our disproportionality work. So we're looking to ensure that our referral data, our suspension data, is um, in proportion with the um, subgroups that are represented in our schools. Advanced coursework is another priority goal for our district, and that's looking at access, but also completion of advanced coursework. For our high schools, advanced coursework is identified as your concurrent enrollment courses, AP courses, and then also some of our capstone courses. So you, um, at West, there's um, advanced manufacturing. At a lot of our schools, we have specific um, career tech education courses that have capstones, um, student built homes, which you're familiar with, as a capstone course. And so we also look at that to ensure that we have good representation of all of our subgroups in those courses as well. Another broad area that we um, are looking at is college and career readiness. And there are two goals within college and career readiness. One is um, the percentage of high school students who complete and pass one college level course, and that is concurrent enrollment, but also an AP course where they're earning a three or better. Also, we're looking at percentage of 11th grade students who are college and career ready, and we've always looked at that in reference to our IO assessment data. That goal, that specific goal will change when we get our new state assessment. And then our graduation rate. So for graduation, we're referring to, we want our um, the four, four year and five year graduation rates will increase by 1%. And that ensures that, that, that if we increase our graduation rate, our dropout rate will then decrease. So those two goals are really measuring the same thing. One is looking at increasing it, and of course, conversely, you're looking at reducing the dropout rate. Then on track for graduation is ensuring that not, we're not waiting until students are in their senior year, but we're ensuring that by the end of their freshman year that they have that 6.5 credits so that they're on track, they have those core requirements to progress. So the first year in our um, teaching and learning plan, and Mary's gonna pull up pages one through two in your board packet, You'll see where it says um, building expected year goal ones. Everyone in our dis every building in our district wrote a goal in reference to those 21 goals at their specific building level. And so some celebrations that we need to note in that first year is that as a district we created a data dashboard that reflected the data for that specific building so that Central could look at their data and to see how are they doing in course completion and grades at, while at an elementary school could be looking at how they were doing with their attendance and behavior data. So while they wrote the goals, they also were able to really easily access a data visualization called Tableau to see where they were and how they compared to the district average. Another celebration that first year of the teaching and learning plan is that we really began our PLC process, which is called is the professional learning community process. And that ensured that we had structures of collaboration that were present at all of our buildings across the district. Those structures of collaboration um, started from the district level and worked its way all the way down to the buildings, so building leadership teams, to the teacher level where every teacher um, sits on a collaborative teacher team where they get to answer the four PLC questions and really collaborate on what is it we want all of our students to learn, how do we know that they're learning it, what do we do when they don't learn it, well what do we do with the kids who are walking in, they already have those standards. And so that first year we, st we set that um, structure of collaboration in place and so that was a huge success. 
The DSAT was another, it's called the District Student Achievement Team. And that's a, that's a um, collaborate, collaboration group that gets together twice a year, and that's representatives of building leadership, district leadership, that goes through and really monitors and, uh, and ensures that those goals are being met and plans the action steps towards us. So what needs to happen if we're not, if we aren't reaching um, the incremental goal, the incremental benchmarks to ensure that we have those goals met by the end of five years. So that district student achievement team is the one that looks at this data, helps to communicate it to the buildings, determines the action steps that might need to happen either during district professional development or other types of communication. And so the rest of this presentation, we're gonna be breaking it down. That was year one overview. Those are all still the teaching and learning plan goals. But we're gonna go into that building expected year two goals. And um, I'm gonna call Bonnie and Phil are gonna come up and they're gonna share some successes with that goal. The expected building goal for 1718 at the elementary was that the percentage of students at our benchmark on the FAST or the universal assessment will increase 10% by May of 2018. While we didn't meet that goal, we did have some celebrations and some movement in that direction. Hello. So we first wanted to celebrate that all grade levels um, saw an increase from spring of 2017 to spring of 2018 on all of the universal screening assessments. Um, in addition, all grades showed significant gain from spring of 2017 to spring of 2018, either um, with the A reading and or the CBM. First grade showed significant gain from spring of 17 to spring of 18 in all of the areas, A reading, CBM, and early reading. So some great success at first grade. Several of our buildings met their goal of increasing by at least 10%, which is the goal that Bill was um, referencing. And so that was Jefferson, Truman, Madison, and Wilson. And our next steps is obviously to look at that data deeper, dive in deeper, and talk about how do we replicate um, those accomplishments and celebrations so that we can have them in all of our schools. Um, we also wanted to celebrate that accuracy and fluency is improving. And by focusing on those, what we're going to see is that comprehension should follow. You have to have those solid foundational skills first to then go on to the comprehension. We see a perfect example of that with fifth grade. So we saw significant gains in fluency. And while that's a celebration, the reason it's such a celebration is we have to think back that in the lower grades, they had solid instruction and were accurate, proficient readers so that by the time they got to the upper grades, fourth and fifth, they were able to truly focus on fluency. Um, in addition to that, a big celebration is that kindergarten had um, early reading and the, on the early reading test, they had the highest proficiency of all grades. So starting really solid at some of our younger grade levels. The celebrations that Bonnie was mentioning are in your board packet. The data set is um, pages three through four. Marianne Corbin is gonna come up and talk about the intermediate expected year two goal and the, the data for that goal is in your board packet on pages four through 10. So our, our building expected year two goals for intermediate was the percent of students who are passing their core courses with a C or better will increase from the previous year's results by 10% as measured by course final grades. We did not meet that district-wide, but we do have some celebrations at the intermediate level. The first is district-wide, 80% of all sixth through eighth grade students earned a C or better in their math courses. We also had Wood Intermediate, which met the goal of 80% of the students earning a C or better in all grades and all four core areas. Our high school expected year two goal was the percent of freshmen who are passing the following core courses, Algebra, English One, Earth and Space Science, and World Studies, with a C or better, will increase from the previous year's results by 10% as measured by course final grades. We didn't meet that district-wide, but in Algebra One, a celebration is that Central 
Mid-City and North High School met the goal of increasing the number of freshman students earning a C or better by 10%. We also celebrate that Earth-Space Science, all four high schools, increased the percent of freshman students that earned a C or better. So the next set of, of goals that you'll see are year three expected goals. So as we come into this school year, here are our goals. And you'll notice that we have a next step section over here. This next step section was developed by our DSAT and, uh, and recommendations from departments. And so the first goal that I have, it says preschool off to the left. Within three years, 80% of all incoming kindergartners will attend a preschool or a school-wide voluntary program as measured by incoming kindergarten enrollment. So currently our baseline is that 50% of all of our, our currently enrolled kindergartners attended one of those two programs last year. So here's how our next, next steps and how we have planned to increase that enrollment to meet our goal. We're going to work with our buildings on creating a survey slash Google form to collect data on younger siblings to have a recruiting list for incoming preschoolers. Um, buildings will develop recruiting action steps to increase preschool enrollment. We, we believe that this should be owned by individual buildings even if the preschool program isn't inside of their buildings because the, at our Children's Village sites, those kids are coming to us to their buildings. Um, work with elementary buildings to find location to house preschools. We took all of our data and we looked at where students were coming in and we realized that there were pockets uh, in, our, in our school system where we did not have our own children's village sites and they were seeking out um, the school wide voluntary programs and potentially not coming to our schools. So we, we put a children's village at Eisenhower and Washington because those are the two locations we felt we'd be able to best recruit and maintain our own um, students. So currently there are two program, there's pro there are programs there and we look to expand that in the upcoming year. All right, Bonnie and I are gonna talk to you about the elementary um, building expected year three goals. Before we do, I want you to note that after our year two goals, we added more expected year, goal, year three goals. And um, there was a lot of conversation around um, why to add some goals back to the buildings. When we say expected year goals, that means that the buildings not only are writing a goal for it, but they're presenting on how well they're doing at the end of it. So they are taking some actions. Some of these next steps that we're presenting to you are next steps we're doing collectively as a district, but then the buildings have to put those steps into actualization. And so after year two, we, had, we added additional goals for those levels. So at the elementary, you're going to see that there are four expected year um, three goals. The first one is we're looking at average daily attendance. So the number of students who have chronic absences. Chronic absence is defined as a student who is attending 89% of the time or below. So they're, that would be somebody who's chronically absent. And we allowed them to write their goal from where they were and try specifically for students and to reduce it. So as a district, to give you some perspective, we have 1,017 students who are chronically absent currently. So some next steps looking at that goal in our baseline data is that we do have an elementary dist district um, attendance team. And this team this year is going to include our AmeriCorps members as well as our counselors. We will meet quarterly to review data and action items accordingly. Um, share strategies and plan PD that we can take back to each of the buildings. Um, that's in accordance with the Attendance Works program. In addition, our AmeriCorps workers um, will be recruited, supported, and available in each of our elementary buildings. We're working really hard to get 100% um, in each of our buildings this year. And we will continue to utilize our SIT tool, which is our student intervention um, team that looks at a tool specifically for chronic absences um, to help provide support. Goals, goals three and four for the elementary are looking at that universal screening data that I t was referred to um, in year one, when we are one of our priority goals. And so this, the, fir the first one is the percentage of students 
it's at Benchmark. And the name of this assessment is called Fast Literacy. We look at early reading, which is a subset, K-1, and then CBM, which is our, it's a, it's a curriculum-based measurement, and that's looking at how fluent students are reading. We give that in second through fifth grade. This will increase 10% by May 2019, using May 2018 as a baseline. So to give you some perspective on that, in early reading um, district-wide, we had 62.3% of our students who were meeting that benchmark. And then for that CBM, that fluency, how fast they read, that is 53.5%. Um, and the CBM is not just about how fast they read, it's also about how accurate they read. The fourth goal, again, is looking at that um, universal screening data, and that is using fall to spring, 1718 growth as a baseline, that a percent, uh, set percent of students in each grade will make expected growth from fall to spring, 1819 on early reading, K1, and CBM in second through fifth. And so that first goal is talking about how many kids are at that benchmark, but not only do we want students at the benchmark, we want them to grow from year to year. So this one is really putting an emphasis on students growing, even if they're proficient, that they're actually getting, they're um, growing to the next grade level. So our next steps in relation to goals three and four are that data will be analyzed by subgroups to ensure all students continue to grow. We will have a collaborative data review, which are meetings between teachers, coaches, principal, and teams to ensure instruction and interventions are meeting the needs of our students. We will review universal screening data at each teacher to determine and implement class-wide interventions based on that data. We have a start this, stop that document uh, to help us ensure that the instructional strategies we're using are um, the most research-based and best practices. We will um, also ensure that our CTT guides, which are our collaborative teacher team guides, will lead their CTT teams to build long-term and short-term goals that align directly um, to our district and building goals. We will also move towards one-on-one -on -one coaching cycles, um, which are identified in all of our Title I buildings, and provide professional development on classified interventions as well as core instructional resources. I'd say on, on these presentations, the uh, next steps, do a synopsis of them. I think rather than read each one, the board can actually see okay. it. So. Absolutely. So the last elementary goal is, again, it's a universal screening goal, but it's specific to math. So, so far, the last two have just been about reading, and this one is specific to math. So it's looking at the percentage of students at be benchmark on the A math. This is for given to first through fifth graders. will increase by 10% by May 2019, and we're using that May 2018 as our baseline. So as a district, on a math, we were 52% proficient. That's combining all of the first through fifth grade scores. Now I'd say to summarize, just the next step would be just like with reading to focus on those student-centered coaching models based on data review. All right, so Dr. Tata, so I'm not going through pages four through 23 during my presentation, no? Okay, all right, just wanted to double check that. I was looking forward to that, so. Um, the intermediate, uh, we did a lot of adjustments in, I wanna bring this up a little bit because we talked a lot about percentages and students, and so we re refer to a lot of our data points in the intermediate to back to students. And so, like the first one is the number of students who have cro chronic absences to 89%. Instead of looking at just the attendance rate for a school, we're actually looking at the kids, which students, so if they're, we have 758 kids at the intermediate level that have a poor attendance rate. So a school would have a challenge. If you've got 100, we're gonna to try to take that down to 50 kids in one year that improve their rate. So we're looking at students there. So if you, if you look at in the intermediate and high school, you'll notice that there's a similar goal. And so if we go right down, there's a very similar action. In each one of our high schools and intermediate schools, we have a student intervention team. And this team's comprised of the principal, counselor, um, social workers, anybody that's relevant, attendance works, uh, uh, or attendance coaches, those kinds of things. They meet weekly or bi-weekly and they utilize the student intervention tool, team tool, 
which allows us to pre-populate cells and determine our most at-risk students in that area. This tool allows us to also keep track of if we have interventions that we're doing with a specific student or most at-risk students, it allows us to keep track of those, assign students to teachers, um, attendance person, basically allow caseload work. And you'll notice that that's a very similar goal in the high school as well. Goal two then is to reduce the amount of office referrals by 10% from the previous year. Um, you can see we had reduced it by 3.9%. Um, again, that's a, a big push for us right now and even identifying what is a referral. We're doing a lot of work in that. Uh, so this coming year may be more of a baseline, but it's, uh, I think we're, we're getting on the same page at all of our schools. And just like the, the attendance goal, if you look at goal number two, um, this, and then there's a suspension goal that's very similar that Rob's going to talk about later, but then the, the, atten the referral goal in the high school is very similar. And this is how we plan on attacking our disproportionality issues in terms of, of um, referrals and removals from classrooms. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to establish a baseline for the district. This is what a referral is and this is what a removal is. We're going to continue to provide uh, high quality professional development in the areas of uh, culturally responsive, PBIS, and Boys Town. The, the other key components that we're going to have is we're going to do a thorough data review. Uh, we're attaching these at the end of all of our principals meetings. And then we're going to begin to look at how can we support our troubled areas inside of our district. So last year, in year two, one of our goals was to look at the amount of students getting C or better. Uh, we kind of expanded that goal for 3A, 3B, and 3C, where we're looking at just the sixth grade group, just the seventh grade group, and just the eighth grade group. So actually, the little baseline data that you have here showing language arts, math, science, social studies for each grade level shows you a little bit about how we were on our year two goal. If you go back to that, it's a short version of what's in the big packet. We're going to continue our, and to accomplish this goal, we're going to continue our work with our standards-based assessment reporting. This allows students to have second chances. It allows students to reassess. It allows students to, um, to have tier two opportunities so we can prove and get them to that standard we'd like them to learn about. We're also ensuring collaborative time for all of our teachers to sit down and talk about what's working in your classroom. And the second thing is we have CTT guides that we're going to be getting, beginning to move forward with SMART goals. That's a, that's a new position inside of our district where there's actually going to be a leader of that collaborative teacher team. Uh, the next one, goal four, is a big one for me. I'm really pushing this that we are gathering all the extracurricular activities that our students are in. I mean, a lot of times we have put that in back when we had the ESIS system, the campus. We've always kind of put it in there, but not 100%. And so it's a big push that if you're in the chess club, environmental club, uh, any sports team, you are going to be in the computer so we can track how many of our students are actually involved in extracurricular, which I think is a huge part of us. And then, then we're going to move forward with goals from that in the future of ours, increasing that amount of activity for each grade level. Um, also, we're going to, uh, as TJ talked about, goal five probably should be right next to two because referrals and suspensions uh, do correlate, and that's something that you know, it's a little tweaking now that, now that I'm reading through it. We should be probably putting those right next to each other because they basically align for each other. How many referrals we're getting determines how many suspensions. So we're going to do the same thing. Instead of looking at percentages, we're going to look at students. What students are being suspended, whether it's one day or 10 day, and trying to reduce the amount of students that are being suspended and take it down from 80 students to 40 or whatever it is. That building goal will set that determine that. Anything else about that? Good. Um, our high school is very similar, so I'm not going to repeat myself. We have the same goal for the uh, absence uh, attendance goal, the same thing for the schools. The high schools, we're looking at, again, referrals, and uh, for goal number two, which is exactly the same as the intermediate, uh, a little bit different. Goal three is where we're looking at just the freshmen last year. We were looking at their scores and how they were doing with C or better. And we're trying to get, we, we determined, I, I really like the wording of this, that we may see this language move up into the intermediate language in the future, but it's meeting 80%, or we may we'll change that to 85%, and then really just looking at, if they're not there, then a 10% growth or 5% growth to giving the buildings a little bit of ownership of how much do you think you can move your building in, in one year. Because the, the higher percentage you get of scoring of your classes, if I have 94%, I'm not going to be able to move my kids 10% to 104. So at the higher I get, which is a good problem, but that's where we're making some of those adjustments. Um, so this year we're adding in 
uh, the sophomores and looking at those core courses also each year and the next year you'll see where we'll add in the juniors and um, I'll let TJ talk a little bit about that. So the one thing that will change in this goal is if you, we're going to collaborate on best practices and gradings. An example would be calibrating scoring, summative assessments. That way when you go from teacher A to teacher B, there's an equity there. So as we said, uh, the suspended students referrals, um, I'm sorry, goal number five re refers more back to goal number two with the referrals. Um, we're also going to be looking at the subgroup percentages of students completing their advanced coursework. Uh, again, trying to get more and more kids reaching out to that. Um, trying to, you know, at least offer them, schedule them into those courses. You know, parents and families may take kids out of the course, but we need to be putting them into the course because we see what their academic success is. And so challenging them as much as we can. And um, finally then, all students extracurricular talk a little bit. Same thing at the high school. I still want to be able to drill down and, and, and mark how many kids are involved. Um, we did a great activity uh, when I was in the building level, and it was identifying the kids that weren't involved in any activities. And then it was reaching out to them through the counselors, trying to see what activities. Now, some kids don't want to be involved in anything, but others, you know, we were able to get them out for a different activity. Would TJ finish up? Okay, that's what we have. Thank you. I'll be definitely get called back up. Ralph, for the data when your percentages and everything. Okay, now we'll just open it up for any questions and answers. Are there any? Director Beck. Sorry, I gotta find my questions. <laughs> okay, I've got a couple of questions and they're not necessarily connected nicely. Um, so my first question is, uh, it came up when we were looking at the building two goals and you said, you know, there were all these great celebrations, right? And so, for example, um, kindergarten early reading was at the highest proficiency of all grades and um, a number of our schools met their 10% improvement, right, in, uh, uh, in uh, meeting the benchmark on FAST. So, what do we do if we don't repeat those, for example? If we don't repeat those celebrations? So, yeah, so like, you know, it was great to have mm -hmm. an incoming kindergarten class that was really good at reading, but what if next year, or what was it, highest proficiency, early reading, sorry, but what if next year it's not, right? So we utilize the data um, to wrap around supports around those. So what we, when we go out to site visits, we ensure that if it's a specific teacher, if it's a specific grade level, a building, then we're looking for what are the next steps. So instead okay. of saying that when we look at the data, we're not saying, well, all of our kindergarten students came in really smart, right? Yeah. We're looking at it. Are we growing our students a year? Are they, are we ensuring that they're reaching benchmark? And when we see areas where we're not, that's when we strategically wrap um, supports around them or offer training. So an example of that would be um, a year ago when we get looked at our um, fall to spring, we saw some grade levels that weren't on trajectory to meet that spring benchmark. So we identified grades some full grades at buildings and some specific teachers that we were able to offer class-wide intervention. We partnered up with the AEA and were able to offer those specific interventions for to give those teachers the tools they needed to ensure that those students are walking out of their classrooms at benchmark. Okay, so basically we celebrate the celebration, you know, the, mm -hmm. the good, but we've got steps in place Absolutely. if they're not repeated a following year or something like yes. that. Yes. Okay. Talk, talk about how you get the next steps, the DSAT process yep. that we go through. Cause I think that's where she's going out. Oh. How do we know what the next step should be? So at the district student achievement team meets, like I said, twice a year. We usually meet in the winter after because we have semester grades by then. So we are able to look at things for inter, for intermediate and high school as well as elementary. Um, at that time, that's when we're really analyzing what can still be done this year. And we look for celebrations, but we're looking for those next steps. like. How can we share that? And then that data is analyzed, like I said before, by that collaborative teacher team. And then it's brought back to the principal. And the principal has a team called the BSAT, lots of acronyms, right? The Building Student Achievement Team. 
their charge is to plan those specific supports at the building level. Okay. Yeah. But so that we do that, like I said, it's in the winter, and then again, um, we look at in the spring. And what you're reading on the celebrations is from that spring DSAT meeting. Okay. okay. So, and I guess um, kind of a follow up to that, um, I know we had presentations from at least one of these uh, elementary schools, it was Jefferson, Truman, Madison, Wilson, mm -hmm. that met their 10% goal, and I can't remember, I think it was Jefferson maybe. So why don't we just take those programs and roll them out right away in all of our schools, right? If this is working there, like We're why aren't we that. all of a sudden seeing it everywhere? So that's right. a great question, and through that DSAT process that we talked about, one of the shining stars that we recognized was the reading interventionist at Jefferson. Okay. So recently, the, through the Title I office, we hired a person, we had some turnover, and we specifically hired a person that could help replicate that process that she had across all of our reading, inter <laughs> sorry, reading interventionists in our district. Okay. And it wasn't a magic bullet, it was right. that reading interventionist was doing what she was taught to do from Corey's office. Right. So now we built an accountability system, and those, so inside of those buildings, this person's going out, and what we saw that, what, what I saw when I went out and witnessed, it was the coach coaching the class, the teacher, and then that became a part of their system inside their classroom. So our ultimate goal is to find success and replicate it. Right. So I would say at this time last year, where our class-wide interventions were, are nowhere near where they are this year. Okay. I'm very excited about that because we do have an accountability system, and that's exactly what we, okay. we are um, we, we're setting out to do. And so we've shifted our funds. We've shifted our focus in, 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 to that area because we did find success. Okay. So. Cool. That answers that question very well. Thank you. Um, I will wait on my other questions because they're not that specific to okay. this. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Director DeSalvo. There was, <coughs> excuse me, there was a lot of discussion about referrals and in-school suspensions, and it's it's on all of our minds and, and of concern with the, the finding from the state. How, how do we go about that? I mean, are there plans yet of how we're going to kind of attack that problem, I guess? And my fear is we'll swing the other way. We'll, we'll let too much happen and and not do enough discipline and, and i'm concerned that for safety honestly of our students and our staff if we're not appropriately addressing discipline because we're too afraid we're not going to make a goal with the state okay. yeah. i would say that's not the message the buildings are receiving good um i i call them the major infractions uh those are being addressed as they would have a year ago or two years ago or three years ago we're still going to address those the minor infractions, we are going to be trying to coach up and keep kids in classrooms. But again, I'm, in my, when your brain goes to what high schools or middle schools, when we think of events, we think of those assaults, we think of mm -hmm. other things that are going on, there's not the vision that all of a sudden, you know, that student gets to just stay in the classroom. Right. Not, that's not the message. Very message good. is, though, but as a teacher, we need to coach our teachers up and give them more skills from classroom mm -hmm. management and other ways to deal with things. Um, for some of those minor infractions. And that's going to be a learning process throughout the whole year. Okay. Someone had mentioned something to us about principals having to stay in their office now, kind of waiting for referrals or situations they needed to address. I'm sorry, I don't have more details, but it, it sounded a little yeah, they, awkward to me. They shouldn't be in their offices. Okay. Every one of them has a radio. Okay. They're out moving, sure. doing classroom visits. Um, we have associate principals. We have other people that can respond to the rooms if needed, um, by no means. And no, if a student is having one of those events that your brain goes to, uh, they're not held in the classroom. Okay. You know, they're not. Okay. Thank you. Director Beck. Um, I've heard also that it, there's, I don't know if it's just hiccups in sort of defining what a referral is and how to handle and how to roll out classroom management, but um, kids are, being given the option you either stay in the classroom or you go to the office or you know like we've got our system in place everything is working so far we're not sending students to the office for minor 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 things and we're not keeping them in the classroom unnecessarily I guess I've just heard some hiccups from parents 
basically. I, mean, I yeah. would, we would need more information on yeah. those okay. specifics. I haven't heard those things, but we definitely have like um, Rob was communicating. We have a process for communicating out to the buildings what that referral looks like, but also we have a team that's looking at how do we give those supports to our teachers to ensure that they have the tools and strategies to be successful. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, so we do have a professional development plan, and I think there might be another meeting where we discuss some of that. Well, we meet every week to talk about these issues exactly, okay. very specific, specific issues as well as the philosophy. So, yeah, there's a lot of hiccups. This is brand spanking new, and we've got to make sure we don't tip too far, but, again, we have to do this work. Right, right. And, I, and uh, there's two different, I mean, I'm controlling about 82% because the gen ed population, then there's 18% of the special ed, and they are checking in with Ms. Wipert and the special ed department about classroom removals and that kind of stuff, so that is it. But for my and Bill, there are 82%, I would say that's not being the case. If it's not something that the teacher feels confident that they can handle, they're asking for support, and the student's getting that support. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Director Potts. I just want to make one comment in that line. A lot of times, you know, you got Tony Terror in your building, but Tony Terror doesn't get sent out of class seven times a day. He makes it someplace. And that's what I was glad to hear that you're going to boil down that information on referrals and suspensions to who is it, not just the raw number. Um, the other thing is a lot of times we have to retrain or, or provide our teachers with more skills so they don't slip, and I speak mostly from intermediate experience, but don't slip into that power struggle. A good intermediate teacher will never say to a kid, you do that again and I'm gonna send you to the office, because you know 90% of the time the kid's just gonna do it again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just because, he's in junior high. Is there any additional discussion? Uh, student board members, you know, this is, there's a lot going on here, and, oh, okay, great, yeah, go ahead, turn the microphone on. Okay, am I? Yeah, to use these, have you, have you all been taught how to use the microphones? Well, yeah, you've used them, so. Okay, so <laughs> I just wanted to say, to address, um, what Ms. DeSalvo and Ms. Beck are talking about. Um, okay, as someone who's been in the classroom and seen when, and I won't name any names because I realize that's like out of turn, but um, students are targeted like it seems very racially charged from a lot of the teachers. I was in a class where I was the one who spoke out of turn. Someone defended me and she was told that she needed to shut her fat mouth and was sent out of the office with security. So I don't believe that it's major things, and I don't think that we're in danger. I think that we genuinely do need to address the fact that these referrals are mostly bogus and used to threaten students and intimidate them into being quiet. Sorry. Yeah, the it is really important. Oh, I'm sorry, Corey, were you going to say something? No, but what he was referring to is what we are working with um, a national consultant just on how do we approach student behavior that might be misinterpreted. And so we're, there's that 5% we sometimes think of that is a violent referral, but we're really talking about things that could be handled in a totally different way, de-escalating the situation, understanding that it's misinterpreted often. And so those are the two when I talk about tools and strategies that we're giving, our, that's the type of professional um, learning that we're giving to our teachers so that they have a response to situations that might occur in the classroom and they know how to handle it and they don't go to that only that punitive referral method. Nate? So at, I know at the high schools we now have the BSR rooms and there are some students that get sent there once. BSR is the behavioral social room, something like that. I'm not quite sure exactly. Support. Support room. Something like that. And these kids are going there once and then twice. And they say, oh, I get out of class by going here, so if I'm going to misbehave here, I get out of class. And I get no work done, and then I go there the next day all day. 
and they're not actually getting their work done, and they come back and ask questions. And it's why are, why are they always sending them out of the classroom, not learning anything while they could be in the classroom actually learning the subject? It's just why is, they, why is it always a go-to where they send them out, not the office, just to a different teacher? Did you want to respond to that, a question too, or a statement? Okay, statement. I, I, I definitely think uh, from a standpoint that is exactly what we're working on uh, right now. And we've got a time limit on how long students can actually be out of the classroom without document and within school time. And so that we don't have exactly what to do where we have so much loss of instruction. That's exactly where we're at right now. Great comment. Anything else? Um, I had a ton of questions, but Nate's question really uh, threw me off, off where I was. And I won't, I won't get into too much of the specifics, although some of, some of the specifics um, are startling. And the one thing I, I went back to the original, um, your goal, where was it? Oh, the dashboard. Do you have that dashboard already established? And uh, yes. where is it? It is um, on a, it's called, it's Tableau. So it's a web-based um, visualization. It works with our um, LMS, which is Infinite Campus, mm -hmm. which houses our student information. So it pulls the data that's in there, whether it be grades, referrals, suspension, all of those things, and it puts it into, collects it, and shows it visually for buildings, but they can drill down to the student level. I heard that was, I think, something that um, Director Beck was referring mm -hmm. to. It also goes to the student level. And who has access to all of that? So um, all of our, I, we, I refer to our BSATs, or our Building Student Achievement Team. So at each building, w that's comprised of all the administrators, the um, lead teachers, which is a part of our TLCS system, and also um, anyone that the principal has on that BSET. So that could be a dynamic teacher, a guidance counselor, for example, but those, a SAM would have access to that, but it houses the goal data that then will drill down to the student. It can show everything from, if you're looking at referral data, it can show you, well, where are the most of the referrals happening? Is it the classroom or is it the hallway? Is it the um, two o'clock or is it at noon? Is it what time? And so it'll dig into that. So you're being not just reactive, but you can plan some proactive steps in accordance to your goals. And so it's gotta be a tremendous amount of data that's going into there. Mm -hmm. And how does all that data get in? It, it, the, um, our LMS is called Infinite Campus. So that's our, it's an, learning management system and so it's what houses attendance and st uh, teachers take attendance on it right and they put their grades in it so the teachers it's already putting the data into infinite campus all that the data dashboard does is pull it out and make it um, easily to interpret and how close to real time is the dashboard 24 hours really so that night whatever's imported and some I mean uh, I want to say it's about a 24-hour turnaround mm -hmm. um, do you think the data would be overwhelming to uh, board members on the dashboard um, I think it would just take some training on how to look at it mm. but I think what the point of the dashboard is that it does it to look at it and interpret it doesn't take a lot of time it's visual, it's very right. comprehensive what you're seeing, it's labeled in accordance to, it's intuitive. And I would think, and, and I don't know whether the board wants some access to something like that, but it might be really interesting and it might allow board members to see trends somewhere that, that they'd like to uh, explore, so. But maybe sometime we'll take that up. Uh, any other questions? Okay, oh, go ahead. Um, I'd like to make just one more comment on 
like a strategy that I think could work for the referral, getting those down. So another thing that I want to point out is that, so we overrepresent a lot of these groups in how we discipline them, but we're also underrepresenting a lot of these groups in how we encourage and celebrate them. I mean, if you look at the student board here, it's not exactly the most diverse group in the world. And I think that when we're going into this new extracurricular data that we're collecting, we should make sure that we specifically go after those groups and make sure that they're getting involved in things. And like with that cultural diversity club that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. creating groups like that, I saw people that I see never sign up for anything else. I mean, I think that we really need to like create positive atmospheres for them if we want to get rid of the negative because you can't, like she said, you don't want it getting dangerous. You don't want to start letting things go. So we need to encourage them to enter into better behaviors, if that makes a little more sense. Yeah. And then yeah. encourage teachers to be a little more aware. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's great feedback for that. The, this year is just about collecting those activities, and, and my, we've been collecting the lists from the different high schools, and I'm really, I've been really impressed with the diverse amount of clubs that there are and how different they are from school to school, and there's some overlap. But once we gather that data, or we see what those lists are, we put them into Infinite Campus, we can look at it any way we want to, and I think that's a great way to look at that extracurricular data. Any additional discussion? And thank you again, student board members. That's what we need is, is uh, participation. Thank you for your comments. And thank you uh, for the presentation, all of you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to other items requiring action. I think you, you were not you didn't have anything else. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I have a motion regarding approval of the SAI contract? Mr. President. Director DeSalvo. I move that the board approve the administration's recommendation to approve the contract for the School Administrators of Iowa SAI in the amount of $50,783.25 for continuation of SAMS, which are School Administrative Manager Project. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Director DeSalvo? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding approval of the amendment to the purchase and sale agreement for 1606 Brady? Mr. President. Director DeSalvo. I move that the board approve administration's recommendation to approve the amendment to the purchase of the sale agreement for 1606 Brady Street. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, call for the vote. Director DeSalvo? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. Director Beck? Yes. My vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. May I have a motion regarding approval of consultant? Mr. President. Director DeSalvo? It is recommended that the board approve the engagement of free consulting services provided by Paul Erickson that will audit district administration and provide suggestions for becoming more efficient. The only fee charged for this service would be travel, lodging, and meal expenses that are estimated to be less than $20,000. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Beck. Um, can we have a little background on this? I'll take Director that. Director DeSalvo. Um, the, the we were approached by uh, Paul Erickson, a product of the Danport Community School District. Uh, Mr. Erickson is retired from John Deere now, and he does this auditing um, on the side. He approached us because he's been reading a lot about what's happening with the Danport Community Schools and thought that his service could help us um, perhaps find some efficiencies um, in administration. So I have a 
a great bio for him. I don't know that I need to read all of that, but he has good experience with John Deere. He has experience with the Department of Defense. He has experience with Boeing. Um, he's, he's done many of these studies for multiple different companies, and he's offered this service to us at no charge other than his travel um, here and, and when he would stay. So does that answer your question? I have so this would be like an operations uh, admi just administration or sort of an efficiency audit? I right, guess. right, okay. right. So any additional discussion? All right. I, I have a oh. question. Sure, Director Gosa. <coughs> My question is, I know mean, it says the travel and uh, meal expense or whatever, is there like a, a limit? You can only spend this much on a room and this much on a meal per day or whatever? Um, I. I would, we're going to have to approve the, those expenses. I don't know that we put a per diem limit. Um, we would obviously monitor that as this process proceeds, I think. But I, I don't anticipate that um, there would be issues there. Oh, okay, I just wasn't sure how it works. I know with my job, I'm only allotted so much for meals and so much for lodging. Mm -hmm. and whatever. I didn't know if there was... I mean, you could go out for a steak dinner for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. So that, that was my question. Okay. Director Beck. Sorry, last question. Um, what is the timeline on this? Um, I have quite a detailed timeline that he had provided to us. Um, I, I would assume there would be two visits from him each lasting probably a week and a half to two weeks and, and some other consulting. So pending this, um, I'm sorry, each session would last about two weeks. So pending approval, um, the hope that we could get a visit or two out of him as soon as possible. Um, knowing our financial situation, I would hope that he could get here once if not twice in the month of October, but we might be looking later. Um, he's got some other commitments and, and personal things going on. so. I would assume if we get this approved, he would be here for sure in the month of October for two weeks, and then we would see how things go from there. Any other discussion? I want to address Director Gosa's uh, concerns on the money, which is appropriate, and the way that the motion is worded, which is that they are estimated to be less than 20 grand, and and as Director DeSalvo mentioned, we would be keeping tabs on it somehow through however you would do that. And the other way, if, if there were concerns, uh, the motion could be amended to say not to exceed. I don't know if it's important or not. I just wanted to recognize that we could do that if we wanted to. Is there any other dish or is there any additional discussion? Okay, call for the vote. Director DeSalvo. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. Director Beck. Yes. And my vote is yes, motion carries, thank you. Um, I have a motion regarding approval of policies. Mr. President. Director Beck. Um, I recommend that the board approve, take the administration recommendation to approve the following policies. Um, one with a number to be assigned on protocols and costs associated with curricular and extracurricular activities. Uh, policy 302.02, .02, tuition and fees. And policy 305.19, transportation for out of district open enrollment. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Director Beck. Um, I wasn't sure. The one with the number to be assigned, um, did we ever hear back from the Wendy on that one? No? 
I'm not sure we want to keep that one on the table for tonight if we haven't heard from legal counsel. And which one is that? That's the one without a number yet um, on the extracurricular, or sorry, costs associated with curricular and extracurricular activities. Oh. I know. <laughs> it needs to be in place, but we haven't heard back from her, and I don't want to vote on something that could potentially turn out to be non-compliant. Well, when's our next uh, regular meeting? Is that? Two, two weeks. Hmm. I guess I'm just not comfortable voting on something that she hasn't put her eyes on yet. Um, Mr. Scott, have you had a chance to read through that? Um, yes. Is that speaking up? Yes, I have. Huh. And um, What do you think? Is it similar to what your thinking was when you made that presentation? It, it is. The, the only area that I'm a little bit, like you said, in advice of is extracurricular activities could be still considered, you know, we need a, some type of knowledge about what a trip is. So let's say a summer trip or a spring break trip. Those aren't really addressed in there. We want to make sure those aren't considered extracurricular activities because they're not. Those are, those are trips, and so I don't know where we would add that in here. That was the only thing when I my takeaway when I was reading it. Uh, it is curricular activities because some of them is. We do have boosters donating to our concert bands, um, making donations. So that's part of a grade. That is part of a class. And then there's extracurricular, which is outside of the school day, like our dance teams, things like that. So. The trips was the only thing I kind of saw as far as we want to make sure that that can be something that parents are responsible for because it's not part of a class, not part of a grade. It's it's just something that's fun to not fun to do. It's it's exciting and it's it's really rewarding, but it is an extra. It doesn't mean the booster clubs couldn't still scholarship kids and send other families and donate to make sure that every kid in the program went. Um, we just wouldn't want it to be a board requirement, like a board policy kind of. Are you comfortable that we have a, um, at least the basis of an administrative regulation that will handle yeah. this for now until we get a policy approved? I am because I'm actually, I mean, I'm setting up meetings to meet with all the groups. Um, <clears throat> in two weeks I'm meeting with the middle school groups because we actually are going down to talk to them also because we have a few more activities going on at the middle schools too. So this gives me something as far as a rule and a reg for me to use as I'm meeting with those groups and have discussions. Okay, thank you for that. And, and uh, I'll, I'll contact uh, Wendy tomorrow or try to. Um, do you want to modify your motion then? Yeah, I'd like to amend the motion uh, <coughs> to just policy 302.02 and 305.19. Okay, and uh, let's see here. Director Potts, you seconded that. Do you agree with that agree. change? Okay, thank you. So the motion has been modified uh, so that it's only approving 302.02 .02 and 305.19. Is there any additional discussion? Okay, we'll call for the vote. Director Beck? Yes. Director Potts? Yes. Director DeSalvo? Yes. Director Gosa? Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of items for discussion. Um, Superintendent Tate, how long will the 11.01 uh, .01 take, do you think? Oh, yes. Uh, probably 10 minutes. 10 minutes, and then the policies for discussion. Director Beck, what do you think? Um, they shouldn't take too long because they were all policies that didn't require any changes. They're pretty standard. Okay, then I'm going to ask you, would you like to take a five-minute break? I already did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, thank you. I made a mistake. 
on the uh, policies, we voted on the amendment. We passed the amendment to modify the um, motion. And so now we have to go back and actually approve the motion, which is based on the amendment. And so the motion itself would be, again, to be clear, the amendment was approved, which changed the motion to only approving 30202 and 30519. And um, so that's what the motion is that's on the table, and I'm going to go back to that, and I'm going to call for that vote on the, the actual motion to approve those policies. Uh, Director, oh, let me ask, is there any additional discussion? Okay. Director Beck. Yes. Director Potts. Yes. Director DeSalvo. Yes. Director Gosa. Yes. And my vote is yes. Motion carries. Thank you for th um, the clarification. Um, these two discussion items then, what's the board's thinking? We got 20 or 30 minutes. Yeah, we will. But if everybody's uh, keen on going forward, normally student board members and everybody, after a couple of hours of meeting, uh, we try to take a break, unless it looks like we're going to be able to wind things up. And from what's been mentioned here, it sounds like we can wind it up in maybe 20 or 30 minutes. So we're going to continue. But we do want to make sure that you all are comfortable in leaving whenever you have to. You don't have to sit up here. You've got other activities. You've got homework, all of that going on. And uh, certainly feel free to leave when you really have to, okay? All right, thank you very much. Then we'll continue on with our meeting. And uh, we have a discussion item, which is the uh, Pebble. I'll turn to the Chief Financial Officer. You've got information in your packet that was presented to you last fall, so I won't take any credit for that presentation. That would not be fair of me. Uh, Marcia Tangen presented this information to you. I did put in a couple um, very minor updates, mostly related to the dates. I think when it was originally presented and discussed last October at the Committee of the Whole, um, I think one of the original intentions was that there would be a vote last April, which didn't happen. Um, we have the opportunity now to, um, if you take action on this at your October 8th meeting, um, to pass a resolution. Um, we have to get that information to the county auditor's office um, by October 16th to have a vote on December 11th. Um, upon recommendation from Margaret Buckton at ISFIS, if we were not successful in getting that passed at the December vote, we would have another opportunity for another vote in February, um, which would give us time to hopefully get that passed. Our current levy expires on June 30th of 2019. Is there any additional discussion? And are we asking for an increase in the levy to the maximum? Yes, that was what was talked about. Um, again, I believe when you discussed this last fall in October, our current voted PEPL levy is 97 cents per $1,000 valuation. And we are recommending that we um, ask the voters to approve an increase to the maximum of $1.34 per $1,000 assessed valuation. Um, many of our, and you've got information in your packet there, um, from last fall, um, most of our neighboring districts are at that $1.34. Um, so this is the voted portion of PEPL. There is the regular PEPL portion that is part of our regular tax levy that does not require voter approval, and that's part of what um, you take action on when approving the annual um, levy and budget, and that will happen in the spring. And the list of projects, um, 
was also presented to you. I don't think those have been updated. Um, whether we stay at the 97 cents or um, increase to the dollar 34, the list of things that um, has been put together by the long range planning team um, exceeds the amount of money coming in, um, as is kind of how things usually go. Um, but we do feel there is a need um, to ask for uh, voter approval to increase to the dollar 34. And Claudia, with that increase, the overall levy for school, um, I understood when we were talking to Marcia that will stay the same because we lowered the levy, is that correct? It could, and again, that will um, depend on what we put together and approve in the spring for our overall budget and the overall levy. Um, we could decrease um, the levy in, for instance, the management fund or the cash reserve levy um, to try to keep the overall total tax levy at approximately the same rate. So that is, it is a possibility. Is there any discussion? Director Beck. So what basically we'd be bringing to voters um, in December if we approve this would be uh, a levy going from say $97 on a $100,000 house to $134 yes. on a $100,000 house. Okay. And it's a 10-year levy. This, the current levy that expires in June was passed and started in 2009. Right. Anything else? I, uh, all the numbers didn't mesh properly in my head when I was looking at this. The, my understanding is right now that Pebble generates about $5 million worth of uh, funds. Is that correct? Yes, that's approximate, yeah. And the extra um, 34 plus some, say 40 some cents, would be an increase as a percentage, it would be somewhere in the maybe 40% or so of increase. Is that kind of right? Yes. Okay. And then somewhere in here, I read that the anticipation is that that would generate about 1.6 million of additional revenue. And my thinking is that it should be more than that if, if our revenue currently really is 5 million. And I, all this was in my head, though, and that's why I may be goofed up. And I just wanted to see if... I'm thinking correctly or I'd have to dig into more of the details on that I don't have all of that with me tonight I okay. I'm just I'm going on the information that was put together last week. oh fall. okay yeah I apologize I mm. well maybe maybe not we aren't voting on it tonight it's just the discussion item but uh, it is really really important that we have this discussion so that we can have the vote at the next regular meeting. And the timing, as was pointed out, is so critical for us to go ahead and complete everything here. So I'd really like to encourage, if there's any additional discussion, there will be one more opportunity, of course. But uh, so let's keep going. Director Beck. Last question, I promise. Um, do we have some sort of uh, public information campaign in place already or plan for getting people to go for this? So oh. our job will be to just do just what you said. We can provide information, okay. a brochure. We can let everyone know what we have done with the Pebble money and what might not be done if we don't pass it. That's our job. We can't advocate for it. We can't do any of that. Um, there may be a committee that would come forward to do that. But yeah, our job would be to provide information. I could go around to service clubs as an example and give speeches as long as all I'm doing is saying here's the facts. But yeah, there will be an internal campaign. There is something yep. that, ha okay. Director DeSalvo, did you have something you needed to add? Okay. All right, is there any additional discussion on this subject? 
student board members. Yeah, I'm board. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to our last discussion item, which is policies for discussion. Director Beck, would you lead that discussion, please? Sure. Um, <coughs> so um, we have a number of policies here, uh, a list of quite a few that, uh, 19 I believe, um, that are all essentially um, standard policies that uh, no changes were really recommended. Um, so do I need to read all of them or should I just trust that people read through their packets? No, this is, this is just for discussion. Yeah. And so at, <coughs> at the time that a motion would be made, you would have to, but yeah, yeah okay. we can read so it. So basically we've got a list of policies here. Number one should not be on there because we've just discussed that one and we're putting that one off. Um, but the rest of these are all basically pretty standard um, policies um, on things like, uh, you know, purchasing academic materials and things like that. And uh, the people who were in charge of them, the administrators, uh, reviewed and recommended no changes. Um, so we just figured we'd bring them to the board and see if anybody had any comments or questions, and then we'll bring them for approval at our next meeting. That's it. You could ask for. Oh, is there discussion. any discussion? <laughs> Sorry. So, can we make any comments on the first piece? Um, sure. Or are we saving that? Okay, so Go ahead. I was just thinking I understand that this um, protocol is being done to like protect lower income students. But at the same time, I'm kind of worried because I've heard a lot of those same people that it's supposed to benefit talking about the fact that now their programs will be even more underfunded than they were before. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, are we doing anything to like make equity with that, get more funds put aside through the school district, or are we just cutting off allowing them to give mm -hmm. their funds? Definitely not cutting off. So <coughs> um, I may ask Dr. Tate or uh, Mr. Scott to address this, but basically um, the state says that we as a district must provide funding for certain types of events at the standard that we set, right? And currently a lot of these activities are funded primarily by boosters and private donations. And so um, <coughs> what we have to do is figure out what is the minimum, so say you have show choir and we decide that an appropriate minimum is, you know, two competitions and two costumes or something like that. The district has to provide funding for that, for every student who participates. If the uh, group wants to go to other events and above and beyond whatever the district sets as the standard, then they are allowed to fundraise, but they not are not, requ are not allowed to require any student or family to pay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically we are matching what they used to contribute themselves. Not entirely, because exactly. they contribute a lot of money. Uh, Mr. Scott is working to establish a standard. Here is the baseline that we would expect our extracurricular activities to participate in. And if I take Central Show Choir, there's no way the district could pay for the show choir, sh what they're doing now. We will figure a baseline. I'm not sure what that is. and then. Our job is to pay for it. We've got to do it, wherever we, and we've just got to find the money or set some priorities. So basically, boosters are still allowed to raise money. It's fine, but they can't require any student to pay that money. They can't approach an individual student and say, you haven't paid your $500 for okay. these costumes, which are above and beyond whatever the minimum is that the district is providing. So really in the end they still have the capability to yeah, reach yeah, what they yeah. used to do as long as... Yeah, people can still raise as okay. much money as they want. <laughs> you just can't pursue individual students. You can't spend, you can't use, um, have the employee, school employees doing that. 
it's not a requirement for students to pay these extra fees above and beyond. So if anything, I think it provides more equity because now students who might otherwise say, oh, I could never afford show choir, know that at least part of that is covered, right? Okay. <coughs> Any other discussion? Yeah. Um, so if we're adding like a specific standard for like uh, using show choir as an example, where are we expecting all of that money to come from? Because I mean, just from, I'm in the North show choir, uh, I know last year we spent like $70,000 on our show choir, yeah. which I mean, you already said it would be like a minimum, so it'd be lower, but where would we be expecting all of that money to come from? That is a very good question. <laughs> yeah, that money's gonna come from the general fund. And we've just, we may have to cancel other programs or activities to afford it, but that's our responsibility to do it. And um, I mean, it's a time we're trying to save money, but we have no option. That's our obligation. That's the fair, equitable thing to do. So unfortunately, it's not awesome financially for the district, but it's the rules and it's fair to a lot of the students as well. So can I add one? Can I add one thing? The example I was using with another group um, is our basketball teams play in 21 games during the year. Uh, but if our basketball team decided they want to go to a great shootout in Minneapolis to go to that, they would fund, they would need to fund that. That would be above and beyond. So the same thing with the show choir. We will determine what the standard is, what the competitions are, and if they want to go above and beyond that, that's what the booster clubs would try to fund for them. And the hope it is that more students will come because they won't feel the pressure to having to have the fees attached to their name. So actually kids that coming out of middle schools will participate more. Director DeSalvo. So I would just, just add to that kind of like what athletic boosters I'm most familiar with, but I know that the, the musical boosters kind of do the same thing. You do a lot of fundraising, you have bake sales, you have car washes, all those things would remain. The big dance, the river event down that, that West and Central do, those things would still occur, I would assume, provided your programs still want to run them, but those are your biggest fundraisers. So. I know Mr. Scott is working closely with the, the schools to allow those things to continue so that that's how you would continue to make your money. It's just the district has to say you can have X amount and we'll cover those events for you. Say it's two. We're, we're going to pay for two and uniforms or whatever or costumes for that. And then the rest beyond would continue as is, hopefully. Yeah, yeah Christian. Okay, and uh, my final concern with this one is um, – so this money wouldn't be coming from outsourcing the custodial staff, right? Different funds? Totally. <laughs> okay, okay, I just want to make sure. Thanks. <laughs> but it, you, you should know teacher salaries, books, computers, that comes out of the same fund that these would be coming out of, which Dr. Tate referred to as the general fund. That's the one that, that we're struggling with right now, um, that we need more, more assistance from the state. So that's why I want y'all to get out and vote. And we need people that will support education that will help us get more money in that fund. But that's what it all comes down to. But that's the same bucket where those monies would come from. Yep. Anything else? Yeah, okay. All right, thank you all very much. And thank you, Director Beck, for leading that. We have no, well, do we have any other administrative reports? None. Okay, thank you. Do we have any board requests? I haven't received any. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I only get heard one aye. Aye. We oh. aye. Aye. Okay. Aye, okay. aye. Aye, aye, aye. All right, aye, this, aye, aye, this aye. meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>